Hey guys, welcome to Dr. Bean Lectures. The following video presents a review of Dr. Mobin's lecture on cerebrospinal fluid. CSF is a critical topic for USMLE and for clinical practice. This video includes concepts like CSF production, circulation, and composition in various diseases. Visit drbean.com for the complete lecture. Okay guys, this is Mubeen. We are talking about the central nervous system. This lecture we just delivered is the cerebrospinal fluid. We went into a lots of detail. Now this is the review. Again, this review is for those who have already uh, listened to this lecture once before or for those folks who are doing tests or exams and they just have short time to review the topic. So here goes. CSF, if you see here, here is a list of things that we should know about the CSF functions of the CSF, production, the CSF and brain uh, uh, blood barrier, volumes of CSF, composition of the CSF, flow of the CSF and the reason for the flow of the CSF, reabsorption, profiles and biomarkers. So let us very quickly get to them and get done with them. So functions, buoyancy, it is a fluid, when you put something on the fluid it causes it to be buoyant, the, the buoyancy of the fluid causes the reduction in weight or at least a feeling of reduction of weight. So what happens is that the brain that is present inside the cavities, tight bony cavities, if the CSF was not present, one will feel the weight of the brain. Secondly, the protection, if the brain would move around and hit the bones, it would become contused and bruised and hurt very fast. So it provides the buoyancy and protection. Then is homeostasis, nutrition and waste clearance. So what happens is CSF is very tightly controlled. This is, the, this is the environment for the brain in which the brain lives. That environment is very different from the blood environment. So that composition of the CSF is very tightly managed. So the function of the CSF is to create homeostasis for the brain, then to provide nutrition. All the nutrition going to the brain passes through the CSF and then to the brain. And finally, the waste products that are produced by the brain's function move back into the CSF and from there to the blood. So this is the primary environment for the brain to live in. Brain does not live in the blood environment, it lives in the CSF environment. Now volumes, normal capacity for the nervous system cavities is about 1600 to 1700 milliliter. Out of those, about out of that, 150 milliliter is the CSF capacity or, or the volume present at one time. Now CSF total production, daily production is about 500 milliliter. So 150 milliliter CSF present at one time, 500 milliliter produced every day, that means about three times in a day CSF is replenished. CSF is, is cycled three times a day. The pH of the CF, CSF is 7.33. So that is the functions and the um, volumes. Now let us look at how the CSF is produced. But even before that, why not we look at the flow first. So come here to this diagram. This is the brain tissue here. This red layer around the brain tissue is the pia matter. Outside the pia matter, this blue layer is the arachnoid matter. So between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter is the subarachnoid space. That is where the CSF actually lives in addition to living inside the ventricular cavities. Outside the arachnoid is the dura matter. Dura matter normally is by layer. One is stuck to the bone that is a periosteal layer and then the second layer is stuck to the periosteal layer but in some areas it would be separating out in the forms of sinuses. Sinuses are kind of the veins for the brain tissue. Now, if you see here, we have done the lecture for the ventricle separately as well. The ventricles of the brain, the cerebrum have gotten the lateral ventricles, those C-shaped structures. Lateral ventricles through the foramen of Monroe open in the third ventricle. These are the third ventricles are present between the two thalami and the hypothalami. The third, there is one third ventricle that connects to two lateral ventricles through the foramen of Monroe. 
then in the midbrain here third ventricle continues as the aqueduct of sylvius then in the pons and medulla upper half and lower half of the fourth ventricle is present in the spinal cord then the fourth ventricle continues as the spinal canal now fourth ventricle is where the action is why is that important fourth ventricle has five openings it is connected to the aqueduct of sylvius above to the spinal cord below then laterally it has two foramina called foramen of lushka l for lateral l for lushka and in the median roof it has the foramen of majendi m for median and m for majendi these three foramina lushka two lushkas and one majendi they connect out to the subarachnoid space so this is where the action is please don't forget that what that means is that the csf from inside the ventricular cavities would spill out into the subarachnoid spaces through these three foramina so any infection there any tumors there any obliteration there any obstacle there would cause hydrocephalus that means the increase pressure of the csf inside the ventricular cavities okay so the csf now produced in the choroid plexus what are the choroid plexus these are and we will talk about that over here these are the blood vessels or the capillaries that are present in the cavities of the ventricle in the in the floor of the lateral ventricle then roof of the temporal part of the lateral ventricle then roof of the third ventricle and the lower median part of the fourth ventricle the choroid plexus there are really the capillary structures that are going to be helping make the the uh, csf so these areas would also be called blood csf barriers we would look at them in detail over here so csf is produced in the choroid plexus inside the ventricular cavities from there through the foramina in the fourth ventricle it would come out in the subarachnoid space from there it would go up to various sinuses and inside the sinuses there are arachnoid villi these are the subarachnoid spaces that are projecting inside the sinuses and those projections would then be responsible for the the absorption so that is the flow of the csf the question why does the csf flow why would the csf move so you would see that the ependymal cells they have gotten cilia on them so beating of the cilia would move the csf just like the tracheal cells have the cilia and they move the the uh, secretions up okay so we've gotten the flow of the csf now let's look at the production of the csf so first of all let's look at the unit of the csf production just like a nephron in the kidney here is a unit how that unit looks like this is a capillary capillary has the ependymal cells which are the epithelial cells of the ventricular cavities ependymal cells become specialized when they come around the capillaries they become cuboidal and they have cilia on them the, this structure is called the unit for the csf production or unit of the choroid plexus many such structures form the choroid plexus so now let's look at this one cell from the capillary one cell from the ependymal cell over here and see how what kind of pumps are involved in producing the csf so look this is also the blood csf barrier here is csf inside the ventricular cavities here is blood inside the capillaries this blood is not allowed to spill into the csf and csf is not allowed to spill back into the blood so here sits the guard the cell that is going to keep them separate and still allow the homeostasis and chemical substances to move across okay so how does that happen start from here on the apical side of the cell this is a ependymal cell we have sodium potassium atps pump so two potassium three sodiums they move that causes the sodium when that moves out that would create a electrical gradient the potassium that came in would also leak out that would create even more negativity inside the cell that negativity would then drive so many pumps on the basal side which would be passively working and bringing various substances in or taking substances out there is sodium potassium 2 chloride pump that is present as well carbonic and hydrase is present too carbonic and hydrase what is the function of this enzyme i hope you know carbon dioxide plus water they are combined into hydrogen and bicarbonate split into them 
then hydrogen and bicarbonate <coughs> bicarbonate would go here hydrogen would be moving out and again it depends what kind of composition do we want and what do we want to take up or not so that is the production one interesting thing the junctions between the ependymal cells these cells these are tight junctions so they will not allow the free movement of substances even the water will move through the aquaporin proteins so water would have aquaporin although it would move due to the pull of the sodium but it still has to move through the channels so that is the production or the barrier now let us see the reabsorption reabsorption is very simple this is an arachnoid villus what that is is arachnoid subarachnoid space bulging into the dural sinus and what is a dural sinus where the one layer of dura separates from the other layer and creates a hollow channel that is a dural sinus so the csf this green csf here will move through that bulge into the dural sinus from there through the emissary veins to the outside veins and from there outside or the jugular veins and then to the right heart now the question is what moves the csf from here to the dural sinus we saw from the blood to the csf we needed energy do we need to spend energy here as well the answer is no we do not so what happens is this is a pressure gradient that moves the csf so the pressure in the subarachnoid space is 10 mm mercury higher than the pressure in the dural sinus that pressure moves the csf out and causes it to be absorbed so how much of the csf is produced every day 500 ml what does that mean how much is reabsorbed 500 ml okay so that is the reabsorption of the csf now let's look at the csf profiles what that means is what is this what is the csf lab results in various pathologies this is really really important so let's look at this condition various conditions are lined up here the situation with the glucose with the proteins and with the cells it's actually very logical if you've done good immunology if not please go to youtube and look at the immunology lectures as well if you've done immunology it is actually very logical so let's look at it bacterial meningitis bacteria which cells combat them neutrophils so what do you what will you find in the csf neutrophils bacteria love to eat glucose they love candies so what will be less in the csf glucose what would happen with the proteins when when the bacteria are present in the csf there would be the inflammatory reaction that would produce the inflammatory proteins especially the c reactive proteins and the cells that are combating the neutrophils they would produce proteins so protein levels are very high in the csf high protein level low glucose level and neutrophils is for bacterial meningitis now tb is also bacterial meningitis but the profile is different glucose low yes that is very close to the the bacterial meningitis proteins high little bit high however this is important cells are lymphocytes now please why this is important lymphocytes are also high in the viral meningitis so if you see lymphocyte high you as a doctor are going to say well that means this person has a viral meningitis but please look at the glucose if the glucose is low then this is not a viral meningitis in which the virus is eating glucose this is tb so that is the tb's profile fungi very similar to the bacterial fungi do not eat glucose that much as the bacteria do so not much change to the glucose not much change to the protein unless there is big inflammatory reaction but the cells are important monocytes are the ones that would handle the fungi viruses so this is very important from usmle point of view they might confuse you with bacterial virus and autoimmune so look in viral case the cells that are going to be present are lymphocytes not much change to the protein still there is going to be inflammation or antibody production so proteins can be increased but not too much and nothing no change for the glucose autoimmune diseases again no change to the glucose the b cells or t cells present inside the uh, the system are not going to eat the glucose there will be presence of the igg or oligoclonal antibodies depending upon the type of autoimmune disease you are handling so that is the extra test that you have to do in addition to the normal profiles and then lymphocytes will be increased 
So, lymphocytin keys, look at this, lymphocytin keys in autoimmune, lymphocytin keys in viruses and lymphocytin keys in TB which is bacterial. So, finally, neoplasms, who handles the neoplasms? Natural killer cells in the T cells, so the lymphocytes are present here as well. Uh, increased proteins, well if there is inflammation normally not too much inflammation around the neoplastic cells. So, may be increased or not neoplastic cells will not be eating glucose, they would just be eating everything in balance. And finally, trauma, trauma everything is normal, if the inflammation has started, if the repair has started then proteins might be present, but more importantly RBCs will be present. So, that is the profiles please keep an eye on them. And finally, the biomarkers, interesting biomarkers here, SB100 is part of the astrocytes. So, whenever there is an injury to the brain tissue, the SP100 proteins will spill out of the astrocytes and will be found in the CSF. So, finding SP100 in the CSF will mean there may be injury inside the brain. Tau proteins and A beta amyloids are Alzheimer related. You know that in Alzheimer, A beta amyloids increase because of the gamma secretase activity. Those A beta amyloids then create the plaques. So, plaque A beta amyloid increase in their CSF A beta amyloids reduce. You know that A beta amyloids are very sticky because of the glyce glycine tails. So, reduced A beta amyloids in the CSF with tau protein that is increased. So, what happens is that these A beta amyloids would cause triggering of the phosphates. So, the increased phosphorylation of the tau protein would cause the neural tubes to break down and that would cause the neural filaments to break down as well. So, tau proteins presence means Alzheimer is present. So, in case of Alzheimer, tau and A beta amyloids will be present. Cool. So, that is our lecture for the CSF.